Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning once again. Our next and last session of the day and of this symposium is the future of peacekeeping, peacekeeping operations, trends, and dynamics to be moderated by Ms. Lisa Shaland. Ms. Lisa Shaland is a senior fellow and director of the Protecting Civilians and Human Security Program at Stimson, Washington, DC. Lisa was previously the Deputy Director of Defense Strategy and National Security and the head of the international program at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute in Canberra, Australia. Her research has mainly focused on United Nations peace operations reform, peacekeeping effectiveness, protection of civilians, human rights, preventing and countering violent extremism, and women, peace, and security. She has undertaken field research in countries in Africa and the Pacific, authored numerous research publications, and provided expert commentary to media and news outlets. Lisa was previously a visiting fellow at the Stimson Center and a National Institute of Defense Studies in Japan. She has also worked as a consultant for the International Forum for the Challenges of Peace Operations. Lisa served as the Defense Policy Advisor at the Permanent Mission in Australia to the United Nations in New York from 2009 to 2014, where she provided advice on peacekeeping and defense-related policy issues and represented Australia in multilateral negotiations in the United Nations Security Council and the General Assembly bodies, including Special Committee on Peacekeeping Operations. Lisa holds a Master's of International Studies from the University of Sydney, Australia, as well as a Bachelor's of Law and Bachelor of Arts from Macquarie University, Australia. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Lisa Shaland to the podium. Thank you very much, Ronald, for that kind introduction. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's no easy task to take on the last session of what has been a very engaging three days of conversation. This is my first time in Rwanda. Um, I have really been taking the perspective of a, as a student over the last few days. Um, as you heard, my background is in research and government policy, and we're about to have a discussion I think bringing immense wealth, uh, depth and expertise to the conversation that we're about to engage in on the future of peacekeeping operations. We have about two hours, so what I would like to do at the outset is I would like to introduce our guests and bring the panellists up onto the stage. Um, then we're going to have some opening remarks and then we're going to engage in a question and answer session. So to start with, um, I would like to invite our first guest to the panel. And that is General Kazura, who is the Chief of Defence Staff for the Rwanda Defence Force. General John Bosco Kazura um, was appointed to this role in November 2019. Prior to his current appointment, he was the Commandant of the Rwanda Defence Force Command and Staff College. General Kazura has held various Command and Staff appointments in the RDF, including Commander of Infantry Battalion, Mechanised Infantry Regiment, Brigade Commander, Commandant of Rwanda Military Academy, Commandant of the RDF Combat Training Center, and he has served as the Chief J3 and Commander of the Republican Guard. General Kazura also served Senior Military and Security Advisor and Principal Private Secretary to His Excellency the President of the Republic and Commander in Chief of the RDF, and he has been a Special Advisor to the Minister of Defense, RDF Spokesperson, Chairman War Council, Chairman Specialized War Council. He has also served as the Deputy Force Commander of the African Union Mission in Darfur, Sudan, and Force Commander of the United Nations Multidimensional Integrated Stabilization Mission in Mali, MINUSMA. He is the recipient of numerous awards, including the National Liberation Medal, Campaign Against Genocide Medal, Foreign Campaign Medal, Presidential Inauguration Medal, Peace Support Medal, Combat Action Ribbon, Command Ribbon, and Community Service Ribbon. So General, welcome to the panel.
It is my pleasure to invite our second panelist, uh, Lieutenant General Jeremy Giop, who is the Chief Office of Military Affairs and Military Advisor at the UN. General Giop is a highly experienced pilot, has flown over 7,500 flight hours, and is a qualified instructor, as well as being an air accident and incident investigator. He was promoted to Brigadier General in January 2015 and appointed as Chief of Air Force. In November 2017, he was promoted to Major General and assumed the appointment of Chief of Staff of the Private Staff of the President of the Republic of Senegal, which he held until December 2019. He became Chief of the General Staff of the Armed Forces in January 2020 and was promoted to the Air Forces General in January 2021 before retiring to the reserves. General Jop has worked in the UN mission in the Democratic Republic of the Congo as the Deputy Chief Air Operations in Kisangani. And between 2010 and 2013, he was the director of the African Institute Security Sector Transformation and worked in collaboration with the Africa Center for Strategic Studies in Washington. He has assisted many African countries in developing national security strategies and has worked extensively on the role of the military in sub-Saharan Africa. He's also received numerous national and international decorations. At the national level, he is the commander of the National Order of the Lion, commander of the Order of Merit, and honor of military aeronautics. He is also officer of the Legion of Honor of the French Republic and holder of medals of Grand Cross of Aeronautics, Merit of the Republic of Austria. Please join me in welcome General Geop to the floor. Our third panelist today is Lieutenant General Shalish Tinaka. Um, he has had an illustrious career in the armed forces spanning over 38 years. He has rich experience in UN peacekeeping, having, having served as a military observer in the United Nations Angola Verification Mission in 1996 to 97, the Chief Operations Officer in Sudan, and as the Force Commander most recently in the UN Mission in South Sudan, which as many of you would know is one of the largest and most complex UN peacekeeping missions, and he served in that role until the beginning of 2022. Please join me in welcoming General Shalish to this floor. We have had one small change in the program today. Uh, Dr. Donald Kabaruka um, has been delayed on a flight in getting here. Um, so while we wait for that or, and hope that he can possibly join us on the panel, we are going to have another panelist join us today. And that is Professor Philip Apuli, um, which I think we have in the room. Professor? Um, so, Professor Apuli is a Professor of Political Science in the Department of Political Science and Public Administration at Macquarie University, Kampala. He holds a Doctor of Philosophy, a Master of Law, and also a BA in International Relations. He was a 2010 British Academy Visiting Scholar at African Studies Centre, University of Oxford, Oxford, and a 2016 Fulbright Scholar in Residence um, at the Stetson School of Law in Florida, USA. He has been an advisor at the UGAD Secretariat in Ethiopia and Djibouti, in which capacity he has participated in the peace processes of Somalia and the Republic of South Sudan. He has authored many articles in referee journals and book chapters, including on conflict prevention, management, and resolution in the Great Lakes and Horn of Africa regions. And he is also an adjunct professor um, here at the Command and Staff College. So please join me in welcoming the professor to the stage. So I'm just going to move to take up a seat with the panel and we'll get the discussion underway. So just a couple of introductory remarks before we kick off today's discussion. I think to set the scene of some of the issues that we'll be looking at over the next couple of hours. As many would be aware, this is really a sort of inflection point when it comes to UN peacekeeping missions at the moment, and also the role of African Union peace support missions. This year marks 75 years since the deployment of the first UN peacekeeping mission, um, and those missions have been underpinned by three principles, consent of the parties, impartiality, and non-use of force except in self-defense or defense of the mandate. Many of those missions have had mandates to protect civilians, reflecting, I think, the experience where missions have failed in the past. And I think that is something, certainly being here in Rwanda, um, that has a very long history here in terms of uh, the genocide against the Tutsi and the implications of a peacekeeping mission which failed to live up to expectations um, in, in terms of what it was to deliver with its mandate. 
This year also marks 20 years since the first deployment of peace support operations under the African Union, and we've seen more than 27 deployed over the last 20 years. We have discussions happening in New York at the moment around sustainable financing to AU peace support operations. We have a complex multiplicity of actors taking place in peacekeeping missions, whether it's regional organisations, bilateral deployments, uh, efforts to combat armed groups. Um, we have diminishing unanimity in the Security Council in New York around these issues. Uh, we have the challenges of geopolitics. Um, we have questions around whether peacekeeping mission can deliver for the populations that they're there to serve. So I think in that overview of issues, I think we have a lot to discuss in the next two hours. So what I would like to do is go to each of our panellists to offer a few opening remarks um, and reflections on some of these issues. Uh, General Kazura, I'd like to go to you first, um, and I think it would be really interesting to hear from you sort of your reflections on sort of where peacekeeping has come from, where it is going, what can we learn from it at the moment, um, to kind of set the scene for our discussion today. So over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, moderator, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I think to answer your question, I will start by stating the obvious. We are here to talk about peace keeping missions. And I would say that the three words, the key one is peace. The remaining ones are missions to be conducted to keep that peace. And secondly, I would ask all of us a question, and peace for who? And I believe it is peace for the people those who don't have peace. So for us to think about the future of peacekeeping missions, we need also to think about you know, their past and their present status so that we can go into the future. So to, to be able to talk about that, I would give a few examples. One of them is here where we are, in Rwanda. In 1994, we had a peacekeeping mission here, which was called UNAMIR, United Nations, United Nations Mission in Rwanda. And unfortunately, when things got tough during the genocide against the Tutsi, some, some of them abandoned the people they were supposed to protect. Then the issue was to see if the peace, first of all, were there peace? Secondly, was it kept? They came for keeping peace, which probably was not there. And at the end of the day, they were not there. The second example is where I was as force commander in Mali. Again, we had MINUSMA, which was the, the, the mission uh, for, again, for, in Mali. The question again was, is there any peace to keep? That was from 2013. Ten, day, 10 years down the road, do we still have peace to keep? The third one is just across here in the Republic Democratic of Congo, where has peacekeeping missions from the 1960s. But even today, the question would be, is there peace to be kept? So to think about the future of the peacekeeping missions, we need, we need to go back in times and to see what did we have yesterday, what do we have today, probably to plan for what we would have tomorrow. But whether there was peace or no peace to be kept, we cannot lose hope. We cannot lose hope because we are here to do so. And I believe the future of the peacekeeping missions in, is right in our hands here. 
we can do better. What we didn't do yesterday can be done today. And also, I can give a few examples to show that something can be done. Recently, in Central African Republic, there we have another peacekeeping mission called MINUSCA. Again, do we still ask the same question if we have peace to keep there? But some time back, uh, at the request of His Excellency President Tuadera, His Excellency Paul Kagame decided to send troops there on bilateral arrangement. There was war, the government was, has been attacked, and a battalion of Rwanda Defense Force went there, restored peace, and we have the peacekeeping, which has now peace to keep. There is another example. Again, when His Excellency President Nyusi requested his uh, counterpart, President Pokagame, to help him vis-a-vis -vis the situation which was in Mozambique, he once again sent troops from RDF. They went there. In one month, peace was restored, and now we have peace which can be kept, whether by those who are keeping it today or even another arrangement. So I would say that uh, the peacekeeping mission is, can be done better. The reason why I'm saying so the future we are talking about is uncertain. We don't know what is happening tomorrow. And it's becoming even more complex. So we need to start thinking about thinking out of the box. Looking at where we've done wrong and what we can do better today. We need to see and, and think that probably there is a way of First of all, thinking about protecting the population. We need to think about having those peacekeeping missions with the purpose of protecting the people. If you allow me, I will give the last example just to underscore what I'm trying to say. I'm happy to be with my brother, General Birame, here. Sometimes we would deploy troops somewhere maybe who are not fit for the job. I'll give an example. Those time when I was in Mali, I will not mention the country, I'm sorry, but I have a battalion somewhere which had nice tanks, very well painted in white, with the nice cannons, machine guns, everything. And I had also troops, but they were in the north part of the Mali where the real job was, where the rebels and terrorists were. So one day they were attacked. And believe me, it was horrible to see what happened. And yet, troops were there, tanks were there, everything was there. So it is time to think about deploying dedicated soldiers with dedicated equipment and in the right place to do what you have to do. Otherwise, that keeping, peacekeeping mission would lose sense. And all of us here, we need to start understanding that whatever we deploy, wherever we deploy it, is for the people. Because the peace we are talking about is not just the state of, you know, living peacefully. There, no, there, there is a lot of things associated to that because once you give them peace, you must give them every other thing to make sure they can live that peace and they can live longer in that peace. I thank you for very much. Thank you very much. General Job, I might turn to you next. 
And I think building off what General Kazura said there around um, looking to the past a bit and to the future, we've seen a real evolution over the last 70 years or so in the types of peacekeeping missions that have been deployed. In the last 20 years, we've seen the bigger multidimensional missions, which set up huge expectations with the population. Um, we've seen different types of regional, bilateral, parallel forces operating alongside missions, conducting counter-terrorist operations, and so on. From your position as the UN's military advisor, can you tell us a little bit about the trends that you see that have been taking place in UN peacekeeping um, and what we might expect going forward? Thank you very much for your question. Let me, first of all, thank the Rwandan authorities for inviting us to participate in this very important activity. Thank particularly my brother, General Kasura, for inviting me to be part of this panel. And thank Rwanda for the support Rwanda has been giving to the United Nations. Rwanda, as my brother Kasura said, benefited from a peacekeeping mission not a long time ago. And today, we are all very happy to see that Rwanda is playing a leading role in the peacekeeping, with many infantry battalions deployed to two missions, uh, a, a helicopter unit, as well as level two hospital, and so on, experts in missions, and officers who are serving at our headquarters, and so on. So we are very thankful to Rwanda, who is actually ranked number four out of 123 <laughs> countries. That are. Now, I would like also to thank my brother, General Tineka, who served as a force commander in UNMIS up until recently. And I'm very happy to see that he's here to share his experience with you. Uh, I benefit as a military advisor from his support. And I would like really all of us to thank him for making himself, himself available to share his huge experience <laughs> and expertise. Now, coming back to peacekeeping, I think we have a lot of concerns. I used to say that peacekeeping is at the crossroads today. But being the military advisor, and therefore being between the political leadership and my colleagues who are deployed in the field and who are responsible of the operational dimension of peacekeeping missions. I would let my two brothers focus more on the operational aspect, but I, will sh I, I would rather share the political considerations. Today, it is clear that we are suffering from a lack of trust from our citizens who are not always convinced that we are doing what they are expecting from us. And this is a very big concern because it is very difficult for peacekeeping to be successful without having the support of our citizens without having their confidence and their trust. So this lack of trust, in our opinion, is coming from what we call expectation gaps. Expectation gaps due to the fact that, on the one hand, the United Nations can do only what the member states want the United States to do. And the United States can do only what the member states have made available as resources to them to undertake their missions. And on the other hand, we have most of our populations who are expecting the UN to come and support whenever they are suffering 
from insecurity. Now, I think we need to go back to the reasons why the UN was created. Let's remember that everything started in the Atlantic Ocean when President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill met in a warship and complained about the insecurity, the misery, the violations of human rights the world was suffering from in 1941. And all took, make the promise to do their best to fight against war, to fight against misery, and to promote human rights. And this declaration of the Atlantic Ocean became later the foundation of the UN Charter. So let's remember that we are trying to fight against war, to fight against misery, and also to promote human rights. But when we are doing it, we have three major principles we want to respect. One is the consent. One can question the relevance of consent today, given the fact that we have more and more non-state actors who are playing a very important role in the conflict, how can we expect consent from them before deploying? But the consent is still there. The second is the impartiality, which is the backbone of what the UN is doing. If we lose our impartiality, it's going to be extremely difficult for us to continue to benefit from our legitimacy and our credibility to do work on behalf of the international community. And the third one is the self-defense. We use violence only when we are in self-defense conditions. And how can we continue to stick to this principle when we know that most of the non-state actors are not recognizing our impartiality and are targeting us the same way they are targeting the adversaries and the enemies. So I think it is important for us to know that the organization we have created, the missions we are undertaking, are not always in the capacity to solve the real problems our citizens are facing on the ground. But for the moment, this is the organization we have. It's not perfect. Everyone has a role to play to make it improve, and it cannot substitute the responsibilities our single states have vis-a-vis -vis of their population. And we can discuss this issue again. The second consideration I would like to highlight is related to the fact that we are having concerns and they, they are obvious now. Concerns to, in a very short period of time, vote a resolution and have a mandate. This is the result of the political tensions we are witnessing today throughout the world. The Security Council is the organ that is entitled to vote a resolution and give a mandate. As you know, we don't have unity. We don't have always homogeneity within the Security Council for the members to agree, find a compromise to vote in a very timely manner the resolution we need and the mandate. And because of political considerations, national interest, it is so difficult for the permanent members to agree that when they agree, they have done so many compromises that the mandate that is voted and given to the peacekeepers is not always precise enough 
to tackle efficiently the difficulties people are facing on the ground. This is a big problem, the mandate. It is generally too general that it, is, it can be interpreted in many ways. If you take some missions, mandates, and you compare with what we are trying to deal with on the ground, in general, there is no coherence or no adaptation between the mandate that is very general and the concrete difficulties people are facing on the ground. So right after the mandate is voted, you can see that there is disappointment, frustration among the populations who were expecting the international community to deploy and face the difficulties on the ground. This is also something at the political level that is a reality. The third one I would like to share is related to the fact that peacekeeping is suffering a lot from misinformation and disinformation. The use of social media to manipulate the information, to undertake propaganda against peacekeeping missions is creating a lot of challenges to our missions. And it is creating anti-sentiment vis-a-vis our mission. And how can we be successful in our missions if we don't have the trust and the confidence of the people we are working for and we are working with? It is impossible. Because peacekeepers are not deployed to substitute. They are deployed to accompany. Peacekeeping alone will never be the solution of our conflict, but it is part of the solution. It's a combination of what peacekeepers are doing to support, plus what the institutions at the national level are doing, I'm thinking of the state, what the populations are doing, what civil societies are doing, what the youth, the women associations are doing. So peacekeeping should be understood as being only part of the solution, but will never be the solution. I would like to finish sharing another phenomenon we are suffering from. It is the fact that today we can count less and less on Western countries to deploy peacekeepers on the ground. They have their reasons, but the, re the, result, the, the reality is that we are seeing less and less Western countries deploying troops on the ground. We have seen recently in Mali an exception whereby we had a coalition of willings who were able to deploy units coming from Europe, for example. But apart from this deployment in Mali, and most of them are withdrawing, we have suffered from the fact that today we cannot count 100% on the very important capabilities those countries can deploy with. So there is a capability gap we are suffering from because of the fact that the Western countries are not anymore deploying group, uh, troops in the ground. And this is also something, I think, which is a reality in the peacekeeping of today. I'm not downplaying the role peacekeepers from Africa, from Asia, from America are playing. But it is clear that we would have been better off if we could uh, take advantage of these great capabilities the Western countries could deploy in the ground. I will keep it there, and when I will have 
the opportunity to take the floor again. I would like to share some other issues, uh, but now I don't want to monopolize the, uh, the floor. I thank you very much, Lisa, for giving me the time. Thank you. No, not at all, General. We look forward to, to coming back to you, I think, on some of these questions, particularly, I think, around why we're seeing this trend in terms of Western contributions and what is it about peacekeeping that we perhaps need to examine and, and address around some of those issues. Um, I'd now like to go to, to General Tinaka um, to, first of all, um, you've recently come out of a mission as a force commander, the UN mission in South Sudan. Um, you have that experience, I think, to share about sort of some of those challenges, but also perhaps what are some of your thoughts on addressing some of the issues that have already been raised by our panel this morning? So I'd like to, to pass to you to, to offer some reflections. Thank you, uh, General Diop. Uh, thank you, uh, CDS, for your very, very important and significant uh, comments. It's good to be here in Rwanda. Uh, you've been engaged with peacekeeping for long. You've seen how peacekeeping fails. Subsequently, you are partners in peacekeeping. You hold very, uh, people from Rwanda are holding very important positions. There is at present an SRSG. You have force commanders. You've got uh, sector commanders and you are contributing very, very significantly. And you are known as a reliable partner for peacekeeping. As a force commander, I have, uh, I think Rwandans, as I've mentioned to your chief, as also to your CDS, uh, are excellent peacekeepers, very responsive, very responsive, very alert, very enthusiastic, willing to uh, suffer hardships for the cause of peace. You've suffered from uh, the, on the failures of United UN peacekeeping and you know exactly and precisely how to respond. Peacekeeping as you, uh, peace, or, well, the United Nations has a primary responsibility as you are well aware and it was, it is meant to save mankind from hell. Right now, hell is, is not just a dropping of an, uh, a nuclear weapon for a community which gets displaced, which gets a large number of people killed, which is at the mercy of the elements, for them that is hell. So does United Nations have a responsibility to respond to their sufferings, definitely it has. Has it done enough to meet the challenge? Partly yes, partly no. Let's say post, uh, during the Cold War years, it was by and large monitoring interstate conflicts, but it left 20 million dead in conflicts around the globe. Post the Cold War and in the initial stages, it got into interstate conflicts. Now interstate conflicts are complex particularly for anybody to resolve. But during that stage when there was cooperation and where the host country was by and large cooperative, amenable to the way uh, the country had to progress and come out of the devastation of civil war, it was relatively easy. So out of 16 peacekeeping missions as per statistics, 11 UN peacekeeping missions were successful. They have not reverted to war. And that is a very, very good statistic when you consider the complexities in which uh, the UN peacekeeping force are deployed and they operate. They are some of the most uh, isolated regions. They are areas where there is no governance or very lack of governance. There is very little law and order. And UN... Uh, Peacekeepers are required to deploy, uh, partner the government, and ensure that uh, the peace dividend is experienced by the people. Now you're coming to the third phase, wherein so multi-dimensional peacekeeping as we existed possibly in the early part of the century was really successful. You're now dealing with terrorism, you're dealing with violent extremism, you're dealing with transnational economic networks and you're also dealing with the region in which through proxies or directly the conflict has become regionalized. It becomes even more difficult to control. My very uh, respected colleague, the CDS did mention about Rwandans uh, operating uh, and bringing about peace in, 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 in Mali. They've been doing a very good job in in Mozambique, accepted. But is that the solution to the problem? 
the deep rooted structural defects that have been are are continue to be present until those uh, deep uh, uh, problems that by and large affect the state are not resolved the conflict is going to remain so it is just not a military issue when you deploy troops and you remove them and the problem gets solved so the un peacekeeping by and large through its un and through its multiple agencies are focused on resolving the deep rooted problem i understand that peacekeeping missions are required or should exist for a short period of time 3 possibly 5 years and if if they exist for 10 years 13 years and people don't see the dividends of peace they get frustrated and they say why are you here you are here only to perpetuate yourself we are not experiencing the dividend but where is the problem is the problem with peacekeeping only well it's a more complex issue the principal responsibility as i as we all know lies with the state and if the state is not able to come up to the challenge and if and if peacekeeping only remains a kind of a bandaid on a very deep wound you're going to have a a, a a perpetuation of the same issues year over year but the principal responsibility must lie with the state and its leadership to come up with the challenge the un in its entirety can only assist the un provides one path of solution the un would assist the state leadership in whatever way it wants to meet the challenge but if it is divided within if there are multiple armed groups if law and order uh, if if there is no stability amongst the various political parties if the agreements are not getting implemented if the benchmarks that have been laid out by themselves now the peace as you know in in south sudan as well as in other areas the united nations does not actively participating participate in coming out with an agreement with negotiating peace but a peace agreement is 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 essential and at by and large is taken up by the region and by the host government so it is their responsibility to see that the peace agreement is is implemented you take the case of south sudan and we have a very senior major general from rdf who's here who was part of a uh, part of uh, the monitoring mechanism in in south sudan there is an agreement going on since 18 and it is not getting implemented the guarantees of this agreement are sudan and ethiopia ethiopia went through a miserable period sudan is going it going through it now and one doesn't see the change in south sudan so do you blame the peacekeepers when over a period of time the state is not implementing an agreement which has not been forced on them which they have signed willingly there are benchmarks to be made i can understand that state building does not happen in a short period of time it takes a lot of effort a lot of conversations a lot of discussions between the various constituents of a state to come up with a structure that would endure the un can help now peacekeeping for a country like of the size of south sudan we have 17000 for a country of the size of south sudan that's a very small number i do believe that peacekeeping has to evolve it has evolved in the past as the changing nature of conflict and as we are looking into the future it must evolve it must make itself more effective people must gain confidence and trust that yes these people are here not only to base themselves but also to see that the sufferings of the people are resolved in some way and that can't be left pending for 10 years i do agree that 10 years is too long a time and if you are if the people do not want you you have failed in your mission i do uh, i'm not i've not been to congo but i did read that some civilians attacked a peacekeeping camp now that's an ultimate failure of of the mission i would say if the people of mali don't want the peacekeepers there that's a serious problem that un has to look look into why why are we failing what do we need to do forget the fact that the responsibility lies with the state and with the partners but you being there as representatives 
of the largest multilateral group of the world with the largest resources at your command and if you are not able to do what the people want you to do what you've been there for 10 years to do it's a serious look within why where are we going wrong do we need to change the basic principles of peacekeeping don't we do we have to follow this consent impartiality non use of force will as my very esteemed colleague said will the united nations accept changes of this i don't think they will accept change of this do you feel that if peace is not being maintained that we violate the sovereignty of a state i don't think we can do that do we leave it only to regional partners to do whatever they want to do we know that regional partners and we know and we heard about this yesterday in uh, during uh, during the discussions that we had yesterday there is an agenda for everybody everybody has 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 definitely an uh, uh, some some kind of an agenda to follow so do we just leave it and does the un walk away from the sufferings of the people we can't do that but how do we then engage in the next phase of peacekeeping that we see uh moving forward 10 years for a peacekeeping mission i agree is too long and the international community is losing faith in un peacekeeping they are not sanctioning anything new they are not even funding you take the case of uh, south sudan uh, japanese withdrew their money for the monitoring mechanism the european uh, the americans withdrew, withdrew their money and so there is no uh, monitoring and verification mechanism functioning and the au has not stepped up with the kind of monies that are required to maintain peace so we have challenges that can be addressed it is uh, it, it it is at a multiple level it is at the regional level it is at the state level it is at the un level and everybody must step up we do si sign a number of these grand declarations of uh, uh, which is the last declaration that we at a4 a4p and a4p plus uh, before that uh, there was the shared shared commitments but where is the effect on the ground the person in the field the poor civilian the civilians whom we are supposed to protect they say i don't understand these declarations please see that i am safe but can the un ensure safety of a huge population at large of course it cannot can it ensure where there is absolutely no governance law, law and order across a large country of course it cannot and even the mandate in that case is supportive of the peacekeepers it understands the kind of limitations that they go through and it says protection within areas of deployment and within capacity but that is good enough i feel peacekeepers have to be more mobile peacekeepers have to generate have to be more enthusiastic peacekeepers have to be in areas where there is conflict but peacekeepers also have to be safe and secure peacekeeping shines when the blue flag and the blue helmet is respected if you don't respect that then you have no business to be there it is there to make peace it is there to build peace and yes you say it is also there to enforce peace but peace cannot be enforced for 5 10 years it may be an emergency kind of response for a short period of time no country is going to send its troops outside to die it's sending it and there are political consequences back home if you lose peacekeepers in a peacekeeping mission they will pull out you are seeing it in mali you are seeing there is a 17% deficiency deficiency of peacekeepers in mali but does the international community give up it should not give up peacekeeping is not an ideal solution it is not the best solution but it is one of a very very important uh, solutions that the international community has to offer it definitely has to do something more but then everybody else has to abide by the commitments that they have made in every every phase of activity thank you thank you very much general smaka i'd like to first of all thank our final panelists for joining us on on short notice um we've heard here uh, professor apuli 
discussion around this idea that there's no peace for peacekeeping missions to keep effectively in a number of environments where they're deployed. Um, questions around what that looks like. Uh, we've, we've just heard from the, the general here about the fact that, um, you know, is peacekeeping fit for purpose? Uh, I think the fact that we've seen a number of UN missions deployed over the last decade, I think Mali stands out in that context where perhaps they were not the right tool, but they were the default tool that the Security Council had at its hands to, to authorise at that point in time, and notwithstanding financing and funding questions behind that. Um, I'd be interested in your opening reflections around some of these questions, and I think particularly given your experience and expertise on conflict resolution, working with AGAD, we see a lot of parallel processes happening alongside peacekeeping missions. Um, what can we learn from this, and what might that mean in the future for peacekeeping? Okay, thank you very much, uh, moderator. Let me also add my voice to the people who have thanked the leadership of the RDF for yet again inviting me to come and be part of this uh, conversation. Now, I think me, I'm not an operational person. Uh, I teach and do research. So my take on the topic is more of conceptual. Um, I think the starting point is to, is to go back to the documents that we have. If you pick the United Nations Charter, there is nowhere in that charter where there's the word peacekeeping. It's not mentioned. Um, and I can tell you, I know the 111 articles in the charter uh, by heart. And there's nowhere where you find the word peacekeeping. So it is something which is an improvisation. Um, who started peacekeeping? We go back to 1956, uh, the problem of the of the Suez Canal and the issues surrounding, surrounding the, the disengagement of forces. So as an institution, peacekeeping is an improvisation. It's a political tool. Political tool to do what? To help the parties who are conflicting in order to come to a political agreement, to support the political process. And as really pointed out, peacekeeping cannot be an alternative. But a couple of points. I think also we need to the concentration on my seniors has been on the United Nations peacekeeping. But I wanted to take, talk a little bit more about African, the African processes. If you see how peacekeeping has evolved over the last 75 years, the UN has had 73 missions. 61 ended, 12 are ongoing, 6 are in Africa. Basically half of the peacekeeping missions of the UN now are in Africa. But even, so, so, so when we make an evaluation, whether ANMIS, whether MONUSCO, whether UNISFA, whether MINUSMA, whether MISCA, whether MINURUSO, all these acronyms, and you can go and find out what these things mean, there has been a disappointment, at least as far as we Africans are concerned. And it, General Kazura has talked about the Muramid. So the charter itself provides for regional arrangements. You can pick the chapter and look at chapter 8. Chapter 8 provides for regional arrangements. What is our what are regional arrangements? The idea that we form regional economic communities. The idea that we form continental organizations. When the African Union was established in 2001, one of the things which was actually not even put in the Constitutive Act was this whole institution of peace and security. It was an afterthought. And someone reminded the, the AU leadership that, wait a minute, you need to have a structure which deals with the issues of peace. And that's why we go to the protocol relating to the establishment of the Peace and Security Council, under which we have all these structures and the norms and the, uh, and the rules. So we, as Africans, we have been, I will not use the word because I need to be also be nuanced. We have been failed by the United Nations. And so we have come out with our own missions. The African Union since 2003 has conducted 10 missions. Now, the only, the only ongoing one is in Somalia, ATMIS. Um, two in Sudan, one in Central African Republic, one in Mali, two in Comoros, one in Burundi, and then the two uh, AMISOM to ATMIS. 
Now, if you make an evaluation of at least the one which is ongoing, which is Atmis, I'm some stroke at I'm some stroke at miss. We have serious issues. What have been the serious issues? And I want to point this out. There are issues of mandate, which has the generals have talked about. If the mandate is not clear, you are going to have confusion. Secondly, there are issues of finance. Two weeks ago, there was an evaluation meeting of the TCCs on, the, on ATMIS. If you read the report, it makes a grim reading. One, there are issues of finance. ATMIS is in areas of $131 million over two years, 2022-2023. Nobody knows how they are going to pay for that money, how that money is going to be raised. And that's why within the context of the drawdown, because there is this issue that the Somalis have been arguing that Artemis and, Re and the general here has talked about peacekeeping being endless. We have what we call the Somalia transition plan. And the Somalis said, look, I'm some Artemis, you have been here for, you need to leave. So we have given ourselves 2024 to withdraw Amisom or Artemis. But there are issues to do with the drawdown. The, the military processes have not been followed by the political processes. You, the military people, you fight and you recover territory from Al-Shabaab, but there's no political process which follows your military successes. So we have a very serious problem of, of engagement. So, so, so for me, and that is why increasingly we are resorting to two things, and, and this will be my, my, my last thoughts. Two things. One, we have come out with ad hoc security initiatives. What are the ad hoc in security initiatives? These days, it is the coalition of the coalitions of the willings. So we have the multinational joint task force against Boko Haram. We have the G5 Sahel force. We have the regional coordination against LRA, RCI. And increasingly now, we are talking about the Accra initiative. Why have we gone to these ad hoc arrangements? It's because of the failure of what we call, and in any case, the other thing which, was a, which I forgot we should have told you, in the nomenclature of the African Union, we don't call it peace, peacekeeping. Ours are peace support. There is a conceptual difference here. Because we recognize that there's no peace. You don't, we don't send you to go and keep peace. We, we send you to go sometimes to make peace. So that's why in the nomenclature we call them peace support operations. So these ad hoc initiatives which we are now are putting in place are supposed to be the alternative to the United Nations peacekeeping missions. Because one, they are very easy to mount. It's a coalition of the willing. Countries come together, transnational problem, to deal with a particular problem. They are based at home. It's easy to finance because you don't need external financing. You can do it within your budget. So this is the trend which I see. The second thing which, is, which I'm seeing in peacekeeping is the bilateral arrangements. That increasingly, we are resorting to bilateral agreements. Rwanda in Central African Republic, Rwanda in, uh, in Mozambique, Uganda in the DRC under Operation Shuja. And this, why is it, why are we amenable to, 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 to do these bilaterals? Because again, it is very easy to negotiate, it is very easy to finance, it is very easy to raise the troops. You don't need to wait for New York to give you a mandate. But also increasingly, the regional economic communities. Samim, the SADC mission in Mozambique, the East African Community Regional Force in the DRC. This is easy way of how we do peace support. Why? It is easy to mobilize the troops. It's easy to finance within the budgets. And so this declaration which General the general from Anmis is talking about the A4P, uh, I, the, the, the Action for Peacekeeping Initiative, Action for Peacekeeping Plus Initiative, these declarations. Again, the central point here is, and I must emphasize this, the protection of civilians. Since 1999, has been the center of every mission that has been, that has been established. Of course, the last mission was 2014. There is no stomach, I think, in the Security Council to, 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 to form or to establish these missions. But the idea is that you, as a peacekeeper, 
I think the primary responsibility now is to protect the civilians. At least we know we have those two very important resolutions, 1265 and 1296, which specifically say because the people who are going to suffer if you don't keep the peace are going to be the civilians. So this is why it is very, this is very central. So ultimately, and finally, a moderator, the issue of finance, I think, for me, is the most critical here. Because if you put this in perspective, we have 12 missions of the United Nations. Now, <coughs> the budget, up to, and they check the figures, the budget is $6.45 billion for 2023. This money is supposed to cover 100,000 people, because it's multidimensional, so civilian police and the military. Now, if you look at some of our budgets, and I was calculating in my head, $6.45 billion is a quarter of the Uganda's GDP. And I was saying, so how do you spend, we are a population of 43 million, and you are spending that money on 100,000 people. It just doesn't make sense to me. So, but someone has to pay for that, someone has to pay that money. The total budget of the African Union, because we are talking about African peacekeeping, is about $655 million for 2023. Now, the budget for the ATMIS is about $900 million. So the entire budget of the African Union is not even enough to cover ATMIS. So where are we raising this money from? And that is why, and we can go into these details. I remember when we were starting to plan for AMISOM in 2007. And there were issues to do with the troops, with the finance. And I know some of the countries which are here were represented in that meeting. And it came to the issue of finance. And some countries were saying, look, this is a, this is a substandard thing. We cannot be part of it. And they didn't provide the troops. So if we don't address these issues, these issues, I think as we talk about the future, the dynamics and the future and the trends, I think we're just going around the problem. And so as, 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 as an observer, as an honest observer, what I see is that we really have to think, someone has talked about thinking outside the box. My argument is that there's no box. So, so I don't know how this, I don't know how this works, uh, but we really have to do a lot of work. Thank you, moderator. Thank you very much, professor. I have a couple of questions and then I'm going to open the floor up um, to the, the audience in terms of additional questions. Um, but first of all, I wanted to go to you briefly, General Drop, um, around some of the points that have been raised here. One of the challenges that you alluded to is, of course, peacekeeping, whether in a UN context or an African Union context, there is a degree of consensus that you require around budgets, you require a certain degree of consensus around sort of the, the policies that guide the deployment and what troop contributors agree to do and carry out. And I think, you know, the feedback here certainly is that a lot of those commitments are not necessarily being lived up to creating challenges in the field, notwithstanding mandates and financing, which I think we'll come back to in the conversation. Um, you alluded to a few other points you wanted to raise, but I also wanted to ask you what needs to be done to strengthen the way that the UN carries out peacekeeping uh, in terms of delivering on its mandates? Is that me? Yeah. Oh, sorry, to the general, general talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for your follow-up question. Uh, I will come back to the criticality of the role the host nations are playing in the success of our peacekeeping missions. Yes, the UN has the responsibility to continue to brainstorm, to analyze, to study, and to engage member states to improve peacekeeping. And that's what the UN is trying to do. Remember, and this is also something I forgot to talk about earlier, let us remember that we do not have the UN on the one hand and the member states on the other hand. UN 
is working on behalf of the member states. So the member states are part of the United Nations. And the United Nations need member state support in all regards for the UN to be able to be successful. In the mission, the member states have given to the institution. It is extremely important. So finger pointing, blaming an institution that is working on our behalf needs to be avoided, in my opinion. And member states should even be part of the strategic communications that needs to be undertaken to explain better the mission of the United Nations so that citizens understand what the institution can do and cannot do and avoid the expectation gaps. Now, this is extremely important. And it is important also for the United Nations to better communicate in the fact that the UN is not meant to substitute states. The UN is meant to accompany the states in executing the mandates given by the United Nations. Now, it is also up to the UN to continue to engage the regional bodies because we all know that at the regional level, the securities of our states are intrinsically linked. So there is a question of collective security. Regional bodies need to take into consideration. And if they do not, it will be extremely difficult for the UN. Whatever decision we take, whatever initiative we take, to be successful. This is extremely important. And I will also add to that, that the UN should communicate better so that the populations who are benefiting from the mission understand what are the objective limits of the United Nations. So that they are not expecting things we are not able to do. Because we can only implement the mandate we are given. We cannot implement a mandate we are not given. That is extremely important. And if you go back to the mandates once again, you will see that very often the mandates are not talking about directly or explicitly about the expectations of the population. If you go to missions where populations are suffering from terrorist attacks, armed groups attacks, and populations, when they see the UN deploying with APCs, helicopters, they expect the UN maybe to fight directly the armed groups and the terrorist group. And after several months, they realize that they're not doing it. They become disappointed and frustrated to a point that very often they can even demonstrate for the United Nations to live. So it is important for us, before we deploy, to keep communicating so people do not expect from us things we cannot do. I am used to telling to some of my colleagues that even if by extraordinary, one day we are given the mandate that is explicit and that is asking us to go and fight directly against the terrorist groups. We have the mandate. Now remember, the UN does not have troops that belong to the UN. We, we count on member states. And for sure, you will be now facing the reality that makes it extremely difficult to convince member states to accept to deploy troops that will be fighting against terrorism. So you might have the mandate, but you will not probably have the troops given by the member states to go and fight the terrorist group. So I think, Madam Lisa, that it is important once again to acknowledge the fact that, yes, our institution is not perfect. 
will never be. He's not perfect, will never be. But we have to thank God that we have the United Nations and we have peacekeeping missions. Because yes, maybe when we deploy, we are not able to solve definitively the conflict. But what would have been the situation if the United Nations were not there? What would have been the situation if we were not in Central African Republic? What would have been the situation if we were not in South Sudan? What would have been the situation if we were not in Mali? So I think explaining the value added the United Nations is bringing is also part of the efforts we need to deploy so that people understand that our institution is not, yes, perfect, but it is bringing value added to what we are doing in general. But, and once again, and I finish with this, it's never, and it will never be only about the UN. Peacekeeping includes prevention. And prevention includes good governance includes restoring hope within our societies so that people can see that the elementary needs are fulfilled for them to be in condition to work, to live in peace. So I used to say that we are all peacekeepers. It's not only about those we call the experts in quotation marks of peacekeeping. We are all at the individual level. At the collective level, we are all peacekeepers. In the messages we are conveying to our family members, to the messages we are conveying to our colleagues at the workplace, to the messages we are conveying to our people in our communities, we cannot expect to have peace if we are not conveying peaceful messages. If we are conveying messages of hatred, regardless the effectiveness of peacekeeping mission, will never be in sustainable peace. So this is also part of it. Restoring hope and conveying also the right messages. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. I think the points that you've mentioned there, General Drop, one of the things that we haven't discussed and we probably won't have time to go into, of course, is the fact that the UN has had missions deployed um, for decades in some contexts, they're not multi-dimensional missions, they're observer missions, um, but they have been preventing conflict escalating um, further in some of these regions, whether it's the Middle East or Cyprus or elsewhere, um, which may be outside the scope of the conversation here today, but I, I think that's something that the UN and different member states are reflecting on um, in terms of what can we learn from those situations in terms of the future of peacekeeping. Uh, General Kazura, I wanted to come back to you uh, you mentioned at the outset Rwanda's engagement uh, in deploying bilateral forces alongside peacekeeping missions. Uh, and I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on the rationale behind that, uh, given that we are seeing increasingly different types of deployments alongside UN peacekeeping missions that bring different comparative advantages, whether that they can go beyond the mandate of what a UN peacekeeping mission can do, they might be able to deploy more rapidly. Um, so I'd be interested in your insights on sort of the rationale behind that and whether you see that something as part of the future of peacekeeping. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Lisa. And uh, I want to agree with my brothers here on uh, that uh, we all need UN. And it was well said, UN is not there for the whole solution. It is not perfect, but we need it as, uh, as an institution. And I agree with them. But coming back to what we are discussing today about the future of those operations, we need to say that uh, the, the operations are not there for the sake of being there. They are there for the purpose. And as my brother said very clearly, they, we need trust from the population. But again, trust is not fought for. It is not requested for. Trust is earned according to what you do. So sometimes people are going to have that resentment because they, as he said, they are not getting exactly what they are expecting to get. 
you may ex explain to them, please, we are coming, don't expect this, and indeed, they will not expect that. So to be trusted is because what you do, not what you have explained. And at the end of the day, whatever we do, we do it for the population. And as long as they are not happy, then definitely there will be that problem. So I totally agree with we need UN. UN is doing what it can, but we can do better. Because as uh, Apuli said, Professor Apuli said that the peacekeeping operations, the, that is semantics, it's, it, it's not, normally it should be peace support operations. But who do you support? Again, there is an ultimate goal you want to achieve. And once you don't achieve that goal, definitely there will be somebody who is not happy. And once he's not happy, he would ask you, why are you not doing what he's supposed to get? And I would also make a, sm a small comment on, uh, on the host country. I do believe from my experience that you deploy, whether it is peace support missions or peace keeping operations, in a country, in a host country, which is already, which is already weak somehow. Because nobody would wish to have those forces deployed in your country if you are self-sufficient. Nobody here would wish to have those uh, those missions in your own country. Sometimes you accept them because you need them. And once you need them, they need to see in you what they expect from you. So I think we do not say that the UN is not, uh, we, we do all agree that we need UN. But once you go to those operations, definitely we need to earn that trust by doing somehow in your own way what they are expecting from you. So coming to your question then, uh, the bilateral arrangement is another solution. As he said, it is a solution which can be combined with other solutions, including the peacekeeping ones. Because you deploy them as quick as you can, your hands are not tied, you can act as quick as you can, depending on the means you have, depending on the threat which is on the ground. So I believe that the bilateral engagement, it's not, it's not the bilateral arrangement and the peacekeeping operations. They are not mutual exclusive. They can work together, as long as what we want to achieve is the same. So we can achieve the bilateral arrangement, can achieve, for instance, what we want to achieve, including peace, and then that peace can be, can be kept because it is already there. I totally want, want to agree with my brothers about the principles of UN missions, including impartiality, including uh, uh, the use of force, non-use of force, and also consent. the consent. But sometimes, the host nation would have the consent and maybe it can accept, I don't know if I can call it consent, but due to the situation it is in, it has accepted to be, to, you know, it is consent. But once you arrive there, the consent is no longer the consent. I think it is the case. Absolutely. <laughs> Secondly, there is the impartiality. Sometimes on the ground, it is very, very difficult to be impartial. Again, the principle is there. It is a very good principle, but the implementation of that principle is not an easy one. And the last one, I think that I very much share with it with my brothers here, the nonviolence. It is fantastic. Don't see these people with uniform and think that they are violent. No, 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 they are non-violent in uniform. But once you are there, you know, there are what we are taught. Once the enemy is coming, you shoot once in the air, 
and you say, who are you? Then he will continue to come, you shoot again, please identify yourself. And he continues to come, then you shoot again. <laughs> and uh, he's very kind, he will continue to come and, uh, you know. But it, is, it does not happen like that on the ground. See, if you are even so stupid to shoot in the air, you are dead. <laughs> because he knows where you are. But in principle, it is so nice. And I'm trying to be practical and say what the, the real situation on the ground. Because so many principle, principles are there. Very nice. Here in Kigali in 2018, we signed the protection, the pr protection of civilian principles. 2018. Now it is 2023. We need to evaluate and see how much we are working. So we have so many principles, so many articles. But on, because we are talking about people who are going to die. So you, you are going to earn that trust because you are protecting those people, not because you have principles. So imagine, my brother, General Birame knows you, you, you deploy. I, I really totally agree with you that uh, UN this is what I said at the beginning of my comments. I said the future of whether UN, whether peace support missions or peacekeeping missions, I said it is in our hands. I meant it is all of us. But again, it is all of us, but those who are deploying, those are our own people. So imagine they are deploying somewhere. Because terrorists and others are not going to write a letter to tell you that I'm coming tomorrow. Be, please get ready. You will never know when they come and how they are and what they want. So it's up to you to be ready. So it is, mine is to tell my brothers all of us who are here and those who are not here, to start thinking about when you deploy somebody, deploy him what, what is required for him to survive because he will never protect people when he is not protected. So the idea, as you, you heard about all of us here on this panel, saying that the UN is not perfect, that we don't have everything, that uh, it is the responsibility of you guys who are here, then if it is your responsibility when you are going to deploy, be aware of that. Don't expect too much from UN, as we, we said it here as far as especially the political considerations are concerned. So I believe that what, again, I repeat it, that is my conviction that what we did yesterday probably was fine. But I'm sure it is not what we can do today. And definitely it will not be what we will do tomorrow. So I think we start, we need to think not out of the box, I don't know, as he said, why people would go into the box, then to come, to come out of it to think again. <laughs> so maybe, whether you think out of the box or stay in, it is your business. But let's say time has come to say the peacekeeping, the way we did things in 1990, is not the way we can do it today. And definitely it will not be the way we are, we are going to do it tomorrow. My brother here is now requesting for the state if they have drones, if they have uh, new technologies, equipment to be sent to UN, it is not what we were thinking about yesterday. So by deploying your own troops, please be aware that the UN is not perfect, that we are not perfect, and do it according to how you may make sure that you protect the people where you are going and how you're going to make sure that you protect your own people. I will make the last comment saying that, please, I'm sure all of us here, no one would wish to have these troops to be deployed in your country. Because they are, they are going to be deployed in your country because you need them, because you are already weak. So I would even say that why can't, do, why can't we do all we can to make sure, first of all, those forces are not deployed in our own countries. Let it be when you cannot do otherwise. So by the time we leave this place, say, 
they were not deployed in my country. Thank you very much. Thank you, General Kazura. Um, given the time, I hope the other panelists don't mind, I'm gonna open up the floor to some questions from those in the audience and we'll gather up a few questions and then come back to the panel. So I see we have a number of, number of raised hands. So we might start um, just over here. My name is Sazan Nia Ojilo. I'm the United Nations Resident Coordinator in Rwanda. Just to build on uh, General Kazura's last point, that we should work towards ensuring that we don't have peacekeeping missions in our countries. And the strategic entry point is a much more intentional effort by us in the UN, but also by the regional institutions, to focus on peace building, to focus on building the national infrastructures for peace. And in building peace, focusing on peace building, to rescue peace building from the conceptual frame that has placed it as a post-conflict intervention that happens only when you have a political settlement and you have to rebuild a society, but a process that starts before, during, and after tensions, violence, or conflict in your own country. And in focusing on national infrastructures for peace, that there is no template that is provided by anyone but we begin by looking at what exists in our various countries. How have we historically resolved conflicts and differences, dealt with violence among ourselves, and how we ensure that in learning from those processes, they respond to the needs of today for inclusion, for women, for young people, and in studying those experiences and offering them up to our societies. So whether it's the Gachacha model uh, in Rwanda, whether it's a Bunzi mediation or uh, Matuo Puk in, 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 in Uganda, there are multiple experiences that the African Union is not intentionally leveraging from and building together. And then my last point would then be that any architecture, any national infrastructure of peace looks at multi-stakeholder collaborations and partnership. It's not a responsibility for state institutions only. It is a responsibility for a whole of society approach for women, for youth, for different segments, and that the logic of early warning, it's not a securitized approach, but looks at even health, pandemics, economic issues, social issues for which expertise may exist outside the security institutions or other state institutions. And so building all of that and the response, not just the analysis, often the evidence is there, but in catalyzing the response and that each time there is a threat, the security approach is often the last response. It's the elders, is the community groups, it's about confidence building, it's about trust that you deploy can help to address them, but when violence is threatened, then we deploy the peace. So perhaps that can then help us to frame the peacekeeping agenda for the 21st century. Thank you very much, sir. Um, other questions? Uh, we have a lady in the front row, uh, just at the start of the seats. Sorry, just in the back there. She's got a hand raised. Sorry to the gentleman with the microphone. Yep, just behind to your right. Merci, Madame Lam. Thank you so much, moderator and great panelist. My name is Rosette. I'm a student in PhD in Peace and Security. Um, my question is, uh, will be for General Diop. We see how peacekeepers uh, are trained in protection of civilians, but we see how women face a uh, different kind of gender-based violence, sexual harassment and exploitation and abuse, but also the child soldiers, on the other hand, for terrorists. My just my question, what can be done really to reduce the crime of uh, women who are facing uh, gender-based violence when we have peacekeepers and ch children soldiers on the other hand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question in the back, just there, gentlemen. And then I'll come to some of the students. Thank you so much. Uh, once again, I'm Isaac Albert. Uh, I'm a professor of security studies. Um, I want to call our attention to why we are here. Uh, we were all invited by Rwanda Defense 
Force Command and Staff College. And I think we should not forget to call attention to what the college should have as a takeaway. And therefore, I think we should reframe this discourse as the future of military operations and future of military education. And because things are changing very, very fast, and if our focus will be on the protection of our countries, because nobody from outside will protect us, that means what we teach at our defense academies must also reflect what we need to know about how to protect ourselves. Now, uh, we have trust issues, we have capacity issues, and we have said that member states are disappointed as a result of that. We had ad hoc operations, multinational joint task force, the Sahel G5, Operation Bakken, we have Accra Initiative. So different groups are creating their own frameworks outside the UN. Now the question is, to what extent are our military institutions actually adjusting you know, to these uh, changes? Now, let me throw more pebbles in the pool by saying that the UN itself is disappointed. Because if you study all the past, the recent UN resolutions, they are not on peacekeeping. They are more of peace building and preventive diplomacy. And the message that indirectly is that different member states should go and protect themselves. So go and study all the recent uh, UN uh, resolution, uh, resolutions. But the third part is that the people are no longer trusting the UN and they no longer trust their governments. I've just shown my colleague here a receipt issued by Boko Haram. Boko Haram now collect taxes and people pay. People who don't pay taxes to the state, they pay to Boko Haram. And one of my research assistants sent me a number of receipts issued by Boko Haram. Boko Haram is issuing receipts Boko Haram has its own justice system. So in other words, the society is abandoning the state. What do we do about it? Thank you, sir. Uh, we have a question, the gentleman here. Thank you very much, moderator. <clears throat> My name is a retired Commissioner of Police, Cyprian Gatete, but currently I'm a lawyer. Uh, we have seen a uh, traditional peacekeeping evolving and then uh, it has become multi-dimensional peacekeeping which is armed and uh, trained but somewhere you don't find it performing its duties as it is supposed to do. I was in Darfur, I was a uh, chief of staff of police in Darfur. We noted that one contingent was not performing its task and apparently uh, the first commander was there was the Rwandese. Uh, they recommended that that force should be repatriated and go home. It indeed went home. So that is a good motivation, according to Mark Graves. Uh, recently, the force commander of uh, East African Force, Major General Nyaga, he realized that he can't achieve what he was supposed to do, and he resigned. Why can't we, why can't UN? start encouraging people who are not able to resign or do, to send back the contingent that is not performing its work. Two, uh, you thank Rwanda for performing well in different theaters, but you find Rwanda at a tactical operational level. We don't see Rwanda at UN headquarters, at mission headquarters, and so on. What is missing? Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Four. <laughs> I might make sure we get one or two questions. Have we got any from the, we have one gentleman here. Thank you. Good morning to you all. I'm Mr. Amadon Toure. I'm from Mali. And uh, I would like to greet uh, my brother, General Kazura, who has been the first uh, chief of mission of uh, MINUSMA in Mali. And uh, knowing him very well, because I lived in this country for some years personally, and I've seen him uh, in action, he, if he has been there uh, until now, I think 
the results of the mission would have been different. Uh, I'm from Mali, where the MINUSMA has been there for 10 years. In 10 years, if you, you don't succeed, I don't know how, whether that should be called non-failure. Uh, in 10 years, when they were coming 10 years before, it was only the city of Kidal that was occupied, 24,000 people at a time. Today, Kidal is only 14,000 people, but two-thirds of the country is occupied. It's, it's 800,000 square kilometers. It's 30 times the size, 31 times the size of Rwanda that is occupied 10 years later. I think somehow one should call it a failure and uh, something has to change. I'm an engineer by background. If you apply a solution once, it doesn't work, you change the solution. And that's, for me, that's what is happening. Now, the uh, general job is very right in saying that uh, uh, the, there should be an element of trust. And when the MINUSMA, when a, 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 an army, the United Nations force is uh, commanded by and led by your former colonizers who have been there for 400 years as in slavery and then 60 years of uh, colonization. Country was colonized from 1900 to 1960. And 63 years of neo-colonization. The same people are there. So, uh, people simply don't trust them. I, 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 and when that's said, it's, it's as if you are throwing them out. No, it's simply the trust is not there because they have changed language over 400, uh, 503 years. Same thing happened. So there is, the element of trust is simply not there. It should be taken not negatively. It's simply we want, we, uh, I would have, our population would have preferred African forces there, present. They will do the job together with Malians. And I think that element should be seen. Uh, we've seen the case of uh, some uh, Western armies. When they come, they hire another country's army to protect them. I understand them well. Why should they come and kill themselves in Mali and be killed in Mali? No. There's no reason for that. But look at the money that has been spent, $1.4 billion a year. Uh, and the result is mitigated. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, we should uh, try to think how we can make sure that uh, African forces are utilized. And when the uh, host country is there, host country should be uh, used uh, very efficiently. And coordination should be with them. Uh, for your understanding, when Mali army was doing operations, they have to give 72 hours warning to the uh, army that is, was protecting the air, 72 hours. And 100% hundred, hundred of the time, they were falling into ambuscade by, by the, the terrorists. So something is wrong there. And last element, when the army is shooting on terrorists, who are not, of course, in uniform. Human rights uh, organizations say that they kill civilians because they were not in uniform. And they are using child soldiers when they, those child soldiers are killed in the process. They have killed children as well. So the whole process is being used against the country and fairly. And that's why the element of trust is no longer there. And when the element of trust is not there, I believe that having African, African Union, who was present in, in uh, I, I should correct, uh, somebody said that uh, in Central African Republic, uh, uh, United Nations was there. No, it was the, United, the uh, African Union who was there first. MINUSCA was there first. And they did a good job. You know, When the Rwandese army went to Central African Republic, they changed the, the, the story in one month. 
we know that some of the uh, 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 United Nations Army were asked to leave some places because they are leaving road to, for the, for the, for the uh, terrorists to pass. So the complicity is there. Is that element of trust should be, that should be there in order for us to succeed in the United Nations. I'm saying it, I'm not a, a, an anti-United Nations because I used to be in the United Nations. I had the chance to lead a United Nations organization for, for eight years. So I trust the United Nations. I, I believe in their mission. But something has to be corrected. We have to use the regional forces, the countries. I, I, I think we can better find results in, in that situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We'll certainly come back to just discussing some of those issues. I think we have one question in the back from the gentleman, and then we'll go back to the panel. Yeah, so finally, I get the <laughs> opportunity to speak. For three days now, I've been trying to do that. <laughs> Professor Sherif Folari, Department uh, um, of Political Science, Texas State University, and also an adjunct with the RDF Commander Staff College. Well, listening to the panelists speak, I'm able to uh, kind of uh, draw three strands. The first, concerning peacekeeping. The first is um, the practical. And that is, uh, you know, the one as espoused by um, General Kazura, where Rwanda went to Mozambique and went to Central African Republic, and we can see the difference almost immediately. That's the practical approach to peace peacekeeping, as far as I'm concerned. They also listened to General uh, Birami, um, and I think that's a, a UN theoretical approach, which we have been dealing with over the years or decades. Then I listened to General uh, Tanaika, which of course I believe is more of an eclectic approach, which is very pragmatic. And then I listened to my friend, Professor Apuli's uh, you know, position, which is more of uh, scrutinizing the United Nations approach and indeed also having a, a dimension of uh, doing a, a scrutiny to all of the other approaches. Now, I think, basically, that uh, the United Nations uh, peacekeeping operations um, are flawed by the same principles that guide it, or that guide them. Um, we did uh, hear that consent is one, impartiality is one, uh, the, the, uh, non-use of force is one, and then self-defense was mentioned by General Birami. Those are very interesting uh, principles. They should be good, actually. But in the context of things and the evolution of, uh, you know, um, conflict and how things, you know, snowball or go out of uh, uh, proportions in, in, in recent times, then things should change, basically. Now, in terms of impartiality, and that's where I try to have a serious, serious uh, um, reservation about, um, what is impartiality in the face of, um, you know, um, a huge humanitarian challenge or genocide, for instance? Um, where, where, where is the place of discretion when you have an advantaged group, okay, slaughtering and uh, smothering, uh, you know, a disadvantaged group? And then you have the United Nations peacekeeping operations. You have the group that is there watching, supervising the killings. Um, where is the place of discretion? Sometimes you have United Nations coming under, uh, you know, um, under threat, of, of course, uh, you know, We've had cases of, their, of some of their personnel being attacked and being killed, like it happened in April 1994 in Rwanda. Now, I, I, I was thinking that if there is any lesson to be drawn from Rwanda uh, by the United Nations, it should be that there should be an immediate, very urgent, you know, um, uh, reform that should take place as far as, uh, you know, United Nations peacekeeping operations uh, go. I also want to say that um, it is important for us to understand that uh, the morality for impartiality comes to question when you have, to a very large extent, vulnerable groups being subjected to all sorts of, um, you know, threats, uh, subjected to all manner of uh, dehumanization and all of that, and then you have fully kitted, well-equipped, well-armed troops watching as one group is, you know, taking on due advantage of the other group. I think it's, uh, it's a high time that United Nations, you know, uh, tried 
to look into this and, uh, you know, take, uh, you know, um, the, the right steps in the right direction. And one thing about imperfections, which of course some of the panelists have uh, mentioned, is that I have come to see that imperfections are more prevalent when it comes to peacekeeping operations in Africa. The imperfections are not as visible in places outside the continent of Africa. I would, uh, Cyprus was mentioned, and of course, uh, you know, a couple of other nations around the world are mentioned. We also know the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina and the rest of them, Kosovo and the rest of them. At what point should the United Nations invoke the principle of peace enforcement and depart from this old, not too active, probably a little bit sublime, you know, um, peace keeping, sometimes vague, vacuous, and really not effective. Sorry, sir, I might have to ask you to, to wrap up your question. Thank you very much. And I, I think very largely, just to conclude, I think that um, um, my conclusion basically is that political correctness, okay, and then hypocrisy and probably selectiveness uh, are perhaps the very reasons why we have uh, peacekeeping, uh, you know, uh, operations failing in some parts of the world, particularly in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have about 10 minutes before we have to wrap up this session. So what I'm going to do is go to each of our panellists. You've got about two to three minutes. Um, and I might flag a couple of the questions that were raised that may be of particular interest. I might start with you, Professor, if you don't mind. Um, we've had questions here about impartiality and sort of whether peacekeepers are, are um, standing by, sort of, and I think here, you know, impartiality versus neutrality comes into the conversation. Uh, and we've also had discussion, I think, around some of the complexities of missions staying long in the context of Mali. Um, but I'll defer to you if there's a couple of points you'd like to reflect on very briefly. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the comments and the, and the questions. Um, you see, the, we need to recognize that peacekeeping has changed. And from what I have studied, we have about the four generations of peacekeeping. Uh, we have the traditional classical from about 1948 uh, to about 1985, when basically we are talking about interstate conflicts and uh, the interventions that uh, the UN did. Then from about 85 to 89, when there was more cooperation between the big powers, the Soviet Union and the US, uh, and those missions that were established during that time, um, for example, in, uh, in Namibia, uh, in, uh, which led to the independence of Namibia at that time. And then we have just after the Cold War, uh, up to about 2014, uh, when we go into complex, complex peacekeeping. And then we are from 2014 to date, uh, which is totally not a different thing. So the issue of impartiality as one of the principles of peacekeeping, I think even within the context of the UN, there has been a rethink of that. The idea being that you don't need to stand by uh, when things are going wrong, even when you are a peacekeeper. So you have, to, you have to take action. Impartiality simply means that it doesn't mean neutrality. Uh, whenever something is going wrong, then you deal with the wrongdoer uh, as a peacekeeper. But that also is dependent on the mandate that you have and the means that you have. Uh, because if we give you a mandate and the mandate does not, you don't have the means, so how are you going to do it? I think this is, really, this is very, very crucial. Now, the other thing which um, the gentleman from Mali is raising, yes, there were forces of Afisma in Mali before the transition into MINUSMA. Was AFISMA better than, than, than the MINUSMA? Again, we can go into an analysis on how, on how that mission functioned. But I can tell you the principle of subsidiarity, uh, where we rely more on the regions, uh, where the African Union argued that they will take the lead. Again, that caused a lot of problems. Because, yes, we have the principle of subsidiarity. It's there, it's there in the, in the Constitutive Act. But the problem has been the competition between, between, between organizations. Who takes the lead? Um, in the case of Mali, again, we can talk about that, and, and it's good that General Kazura is here. Um, the issue about who would take the lead, is it ECOWAS or it's the United Nations? 
Uh, and we can go to Madagascar, we can go to all these other, all these other, all, all these other issues. So my point here is that the, the, and this will be possible by my wrap up, would be that the way the United Nations peacekeeping has evolved, we as Africans, I think we have realized that we need to do our own things basically. And that's why we are more inclined now to go bilateral. We are more inclined to go ad hoc because of the ineffectiveness that we have seen on the United Nations peacekeeping. Now, is it, are we, are we effective? Because there are all the other issues about finance, there are issues of the mandate, um, and we have not touched even anything about African standby force, for example, because also that is part of the conversation, the whole African security architecture. Um, so, 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 so my take simply is this, that as you guys are being deployed, that you need to think very seriously about what um, you demand from the political leadership. They give you a mandate, but they have also to give you the means to do the job. For the first time the other day, I saw the deployment of drones under MONUSCO in, 20, in 2013. This is an innovation. This is a new thing, which means that even the United Nations, even our own, so we are adapting. So there must be an adaptation. And finally, on the issue of women, from the lady who asked about the question of women, we do have now what we call the WPS, the Women, Peace, and Security uh, Agenda within the context of 1325. And if you see the pillars under 1325, you have prevention, protection, participation, and relief, uh, and relief and recovery. So within this context and the new, uh, the general was talking about these declarations, uh, FOPI plus is talking about actually women participation, women participation in peacekeeping. Uh, and so, so, so there is an adaptation. So I think there are certain things, there are certain changes which we need to realize which are taking place in this. And that, that is the trend. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I think they're the innovation in peacekeeping that we've seen is an ongoing theme. And hopefully, you know, we, we get to that point in the future where it continues to innovate. Um, General Shalish, um, any reflections or thoughts yeah. on some of the questions? I raised? think uh, the whole community is there in this together. But whatever works, works. If it is going to be only bilateral, very good. If it is only going to be regional, excellent. If it goes beyond that, if there is assistance required uh, from multilateral agencies, so we leave that for, the, for, for others to decide. Uh, but yes, there has to be coordination, there has to be cooperation, and finally, there has to be some relief, there has to be a peace dividend for the people uh, to whom, for, for whom we, we do get deployed. But leave that apart. And I just want to say this to uh, the officers of the Rwandan Defense Forces. Leave the politics aside. When you get deployed, you'll get deployed as contingents or you'll get deployed as staff officers. Please see that you always project an image of, effic of efficiency, of professionalism, and in your role, display the confidence that is required that inspires the people that this is a force for good. You cannot change a state or you may not be able to make a huge difference, but within your sphere of influence, wherever you are deployed, please see that the people there have your trust, the people there are able to back you, and you gain their confidence. And you can only gain their confidence when you are able to reach out to them when they require you the most. Please do not hesitate, please do not have second thoughts or whatever happens in the public domain, whatever happens as far as politics go. Just focus on that mission. RDF has been doing a fantastic job. Uh, please see that you continue to do this, continue to interact, continue to engage and maintain that that trust of the people in whichever area that you are in. If you feel that going out is going to be a huge risk, is, is, go, is going to be a consequence to your, to your security, please take adequate steps. But please do not bunkerize. The moment you go into a shell and you go and lock yourselves up in safe camps, you have lost it. The people will look at you and they said, these guys are only here for their protection. They are not for our protection. The other thing that I have noticed across the mission, and I'm sure 
my brother General Diop is going to address, that there are, one company has a strength of 150. Now 150 is a large strength, but out of that only 20 to 25 are able to go out at one time, the rest are all deployed on security of camps. Now that is not acceptable to anybody. So you need to see that your security, basic security requirements are, are lowered. You need to have the kind of equipment uh, that can keep you safe, that uh, enables you to deploy, and let the people see you as a force of protection, not as a force of out here who are just guests who come in, stay here for a year and go. That needs, that demands uh, RDF, Soldiers are known to do that, and my, uh, my point to you is please continue to do this, please make yourself visible, please engage with people, and inspire confidence. Thank you. Thank you, General. General Shop. Thank you very much. Before trying to answer some of the questions that were asked, I would like to emphasize uh, the fact that for the future, we need to make sure that peacekeepers have the right mindset. Because, you know, you can be given the best equipment possible, but if you do not believe in yourself, if you don't commit to the mission you are given, and if you are not engaged, it can be extremely difficult for you to bring value added to what is being done by in, within the mission. So mindset is key. Now, if I come back to the questions, my brother here talked about prevention. I could not agree more. I, I said in my introductory remarks that uh, prevention is part of peacekeeping because it's better to prevent conflict than to try to resolve or to solve conflict. So prevention is extremely important. And to prevent, you need to make sure that you create the conditions that are needed for conflict to not rise. And in most of our societies, we have not been able to keep hope. And when there is no hope anymore, there is no life anymore. And I think that in our different societies, all of us need to join hand to make sure that we can at least fulfill the basic needs of our populations so that they believe in the fact that they belong to the same community and peace can, can prevail. Now, it will never be able for us to prevent 100% conflict we will always have conflict. Now, solving conflict will probably require UN peacekeeping to deploy, but also regional mechanisms to be uh, functional, bilateral uh, arrangement. They are not exclusive. All of them are relevant. But we need all of them to be coordinated so that they can achieve the same goal. And I could not agree more with you when you say that we need a whole of society approach. All the stakeholders of our societies need to be involved in preventing conflict and also in solving our differences, particularly youth, because we all know that most of our societies are composed by youngsters, and most of them, unfortunately, are inactive. Some of them are even not hopeful that one day they will be active. So they do not have the same software as people, as, as, as what we consider as being uh, normal people. And they can be engaged in all sorts of activities, including terrorism uh, activities and all these things. Madam, you talked about POC, women being harassed, uh, sexually abused. You're absolutely right. Unfortunately, our women, uh, uh, sisters, uh, mothers, are the ones who suffer the most from the conflict. That's why we do our best to make sure that we deploy more and more women peacekeepers, because it is proven that women peacekeepers 
can interact more easily with woman victim to know exactly what they're suffering from, to know exactly what they're expecting, so that uh, the peacekeepers can help put these conditions in place. And recently, the Secretary General has appointed a special coordinator res uh, responsible of helping the UN improve the UN response in sexual exploitation and abuse. And I, Madam, believe that even if the UN is very efficient, is very engaged on these issues, UN alone, once again, will not be able to solve definitively all these problems. UN need to work with the host nation. Unfortunately, sometimes they are very weak <coughs> and cannot do too much, but UN can also work with the paramount leaders, religious leaders, at the community level, so that everybody is involved to sensitize and to prevent children to be engaged in violence because they have nothing else to do. And the protection of civilians is now key in action for peacekeeping, which is also the agenda put in place by the Secretary General. We need to make sure that it is well implemented, as my brother Kasura was saying. Now, my brother uh, of the academics talk about the education. I think education is key. You are absolutely right. Concomitantly with good governance, we need also to make sure that our societies are educated on security issues in general so that they own what they understand of their own security. What are the capabilities our communities are willing to mobilize to make sure that they are in security? This is extremely important. I like your, your comments because education is part. Education alone, for sure, will not guarantee our security. But without educating people on security matters, it can be extremely difficult for us to guarantee sustainable security. And uh, this has to be done by the academics, but in coordination with those who are in uniform and who are the technicians of security. My police brother talked about, yes, accountability when people are not fulfilling the mandate, they're not doing what they're supposed to do, I agree with you. If they're not, we need to take our courage and make sure that those who are not doing what they're supposed to do when deployed, maybe are replaced. In Mali, my brother, everybody knows that we have not achieved the goals that are expected by the Malians. And this is creating a disconnect between the mission and our Malian friends, which makes it a lot more difficult. Because you cannot be successful as a peacekeeping mission if you cannot have the trust of the population. And if you can even not have the complicity of the population. So I always say peacekeeping has to be done in collaboration with the host nation, or what is left there as a host nation, and the population. If it is not the case, it can be difficult. But if you go back to the mandate that is given to the MINUSMA, my brother, you will see that we are asking the MINUSMA to accompany the Malian state in implementing the peace agreement. Very general. We are asking the peacekeepers to also accompany the Malian state to develop and implement a social, economic, and security strategy in the center of Mali. And finally, we are asking the mission every quarter to uh, present a report on human rights violation to the Secretary General. There is nowhere we are asking the peacekeepers to fight against the armed groups, to fight against the terrorist group. That is the problem. And you can implement only a mandate that you are given. Now, that is why next to MINUSMA, we had a coalition of the willings. We had Barhan, we had Takuba, normally whose responsibility under a UN resolution was to fight against the terrorist group. So this combination, in my opinion, 
is the future of peacekeeping. Because once again, the conservatives in the peacekeeping are sure that the day peacekeepers will be perceived as active actors of the conflict, the same day peacekeeping will die. Because we will not have any more the impartiality that is the backbone of peacekeeping. Now, impartiality does not mean inactivity. No, that does not mean, my brother, impartiality is avoiding to side in an obvious manner with one of the belligerent. We cannot deploy to side with one of the belligerent, but we have this extremely important responsibility to make sure that we protect the civilians. Those who are vulnerable, we have to protect them. That's why we are more and more proactive in our missions. We are more and more, sometimes even offensive, to make sure that we protect the civilians. And the Secretary General has made it very clear as the second priority of action for peacekeeping. Now, the last one, yeah, yeah it, it, uh, it was the last. Those are the answers I could give to all the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, General Job. I think you covered a, an array of those questions that were outlined there. Um, I have been notified we have a tiny bit more time, so, um, and I was still going to come to you, General Kazura, in terms of your responses, but maybe to pick up um, on the question about Mali, you were the first force commander of the UN mission that went in there. Um, sort of your reflections from that experience and I guess any of the other points that have been raised. I know there was a point about military education and a few things which might be very um, timely to, to conclude on today as well. Thank you once again. And uh, first of all, before I come to that, I would, I would request especially the students and uh, others from the discussion from here to learn that uh, nobody from anywhere is going to, to give you peace. Because somebody from somewhere will come to help you to keep peace. So please find peace, then let somebody else, if necessary, to help you to keep your own peace. Secondly, in whatever you have said, here and elsewhere, nobody would wish to have other forces deploying in your own country. They can come to work with you, but if you have peace and you, you will be able to develop, you will be able to give to your people what they want. So the ultimate goal is to be peaceful. And please find your own peace first of all. Make your country peaceful. Develop your country. Then work with others to even more, to even make your country very prosper. And once it is no longer necessary, and it is once it is no longer possible, and you need some assistance from elsewhere, Again, as he said, be that host nation which can dictate what you need. Try to be that nation which is, not being, which is not going to be dictated from somebody else to do what they want you to do. And from now, that perspective, if we are going to talk about the future of the peacekeeping operations. I strongly believe that we need UN, we need the peacekeepers, but what we did yesterday, maybe we can change it today for the better of the peacekeepers themselves, of the people, and of the whole organization because we are part of that organization. And definitely for the future, we need to continue, to continue thinking about what we are going to do in future because 
definitely what we are doing today is going to be different from what you are going to do tomorrow. And from our brothers in Mali, I would just say, keep it up. And let's work together with the UN, with other partners to make sure peace prevails and prosperity comes back. Thank you. Thank you, General Kuzura. So I think that concludes, I think, a very rich discussion we've had today. I think certainly from, from my perspective, I came into this conversation um, thinking that we had three generals here and we we're going to get very much into military capabilities and strategies in terms of the future of peacekeeping. And I think some of the things that really struck, sort of struck me in the conversation was this talk of trust in terms of the trust of the local population. The, the trust in the relationship between the, the host authorities and the peacekeeping mission, and also the trust of those countries sending their personnel to contribute and the fact that they will be looked after in terms of safety and security, in terms of delivering on the mandate, in terms of their responsibility, um, and I think also in terms of expectation management. There are some things the UN can deliver collectively with member states. There are others that other organisations may be better placed to do. How do we work in partnership to make sure that they can deliver the peace that we are looking for in a lot of these contexts? So I'd like to invite you all to once again thank the panel for today's rich discussion. And I will hand back to our MC. Thank you very much, Lisa, for an excellent moderation of our last session. And thank you very much, uh, the panel, for a very good discussion today. Please, you may take your seats. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as we come to the end of the National Security Symposium, let me take this opportunity to thank our six panels of the National Security Symposium for an excellent job well done. Please join me in giving a round of applause. This is an annual event that has a revolving theme so we will be back next year, same month, for the 11th National Security Symposium. Or maybe, if the Minister and the Chief of Defence Staff can allow, we can graduate to a Continental Security Symposium next year. Um, Otto von Bismarck, a Chancellor during the, um, the unification of Germany in the 1870, once said, and I quote, that the great questions of the day shall not be solved by speeches and resolutions, but by blood and iron. I think things have changed. We need a combination of diplomacy, information, the military, and the economic instruments of power to change things, to deal with contemporary security challenges. And this crowd, this audience, has all those four elements. We have diplomats, we have the media, we have influencers, we have people who build narratives, that is the information, and then we also have the largest portion are military officers who are here with us. They are listening that the solution is not always blood and iron. So, it is my pleasure to acknowledge the people who made this event a success. My sincere gratitude goes to the Ministry of Defense and the RRDF for their unwavering support towards the, towards the college's initiatives. I also wish to extend my appreciation to our international, regional partners, University of Rwanda and other national universities, media houses who, whose relentless and continued support has made this event a success. Special thanks go to our sister command and staff colleges in the region and beyond, 
who are highly represented in these events. Thank you very much. We are grateful for your continued solidarity. So, before we move uh, to the last part of this symposium, which is the luncheon, and we say our goodbyes, we shall have the closing ceremony. And in the closing ceremony, the Honorable Minister of Defense will give his closing remarks. You're welcome, sir. The chief, the chief of defense staff, service chiefs, excellencies ambassadors, deputy commandant of RDF command and staff college, distinguished guests, panelists, moderators of this symposium, general officers, senior officers, dear participants, good afternoon. It's my honor to be with you this afternoon for the closing ceremony of another yet national security symposium on the theme contemporary security challenges, the African perspective. First and foremost, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to all panelists and speakers for their valuable contribution to the symposium. And my deepest gratitude goes to all participants for honoring this event with their presence and for participating actively in the sessions. I thank you most sincerely. I would like to also commend the college, University of Rwanda, Rwanda Convention Bureau for the excellent planning and the execution of this symposium. I wish to applaud Kigali Convention Center and Radisson Blue for being excellent hosts. Thank you. Rwanda events for turning our abstract wishes and designs into reality. We all, we all know that what goes into planning and executing an event of this magnitude, it is not easy. We are extremely appreciative to you for a well-planned, well-executed, and enjoyable conference. We really already want to come back here next year. Distinguished participants, engaging in an intellectual discourse of this nature is vital in finding solutions to emerging threats at national, regional, and international level. These discussions allow us to harness our strengths and opportunities in order to deal with our threats and weaknesses by exploiting our collective effect, effort. The, the diversity of our panelists in this symposium, as well as participants, reflect the understanding of security challenges and the need to find collective or common solutions. We hope that 
recommendations derived from these deliberations shall be transformed into action. This is always the biggest challenge. I wish to note that there is no magic bullet to a given crisis or problem. Rather, we must adopt a multidimensional and collective approach that involves several actors and options of dealing with a problem. It's my conviction that this symposium has addressed a reasonable portion of the security challenges affecting the continent and has prescribed some practical solutions to that effect. There is also no doubt that we have extracted invaluable lessons that will inform our various undertakings. Some of the key takeaways that I can point out include that the international order today is a broken system that needs to be revamped immediately. Two, it is evident that the world is becoming divided and Africa must define itself and live by its own aspirations. Three, our world must be followed by deeds if we are to translate the vision, the visions and dreams of our peoples into real life needs. Four, without fair and honest strategic context, there is a risk we will likely assume a future that supports our assumptions and biases. Last but not least, as a continent, we need to identify and focus on the essentials. Thank you once again for the wake up call. And let me once again thank the leadership of the college and the University of Rwanda for organizing this important event in such a way as the, to address issues that are directly linked to security. And we hope that this will feed into the ongoing continental soul searching. I thank you for your kind attention and I wish you all journey messages to your respective destinations and I hereby declare this symposium closed. <laughs>